morning. My name is Richard Miller and welcome to Never Not Here. And uh, we're kind of dialoguing uh, as a profession, I guess. I don't know. We're talking a lot. And what's there to talk about except uh, how we live? And could it be any smoother and any easier? And we might say, well, we have a certain amount of problems in our lives and there's a certain amount of problems in our communities, a certain amount of problems in seems in our nation and the world and uh, maybe that's just the way it is and uh, maybe it's not and maybe it's kind of like due to the things that we're doing and believing and how our activities of course our activities make pollution so right there there's a proof of it uh, if we change those a little bit so we're traveling far and wide today we're in Berlin so I've always wanted to go to Berlin, but never made it. But uh, welcome to Kira K. Thanks for coming on, Kira. You're very welcome, Richard. And hello to everyone listening. We, uh, we're often looking for, at least I am, it seems like I'm looking for a, a simpler way to say things. And without setting up a straw man, or a straw man is like a goal, just saying, you know, what if this was, what if life was just this? And we didn't need to have a, a kind of divide ourselves and kind of project ourselves toward uh, an idea, a goal. And uh, that's not always done when you speak about uh, philosophy in life. Uh, philosophy itself is kind of like a, a model, a model of life that seems to be separate from uh, where we are now. Many times goals are, you know, not maybe not intended, but uh, even if you tell a story about what happened to you, somebody can abstract that and say, well, maybe that could happen to me. And sometimes we, uh, uh, we kind of make a discovery on the show, and then uh, it doesn't get totally wrapped, you know, it doesn't get totally <clears throat> developed. And so then, like, I bring it up on another... And another time, and we can kind of polish it a little bit. But I thought it was uh, pretty great. Uh, lately, we we I introduced uh, a talk by saying that uh, the miracle of mankind is 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 the, is a language. We're linguistic beings, and we're able to hold pictures and meanings and concepts uh, apart from what's happening right now. And so then that gives us a uh, giant flexibility and really gives us a, a giant possibility to uh, build social, economic, and uh, structures and also create science and technology. So the abstractness, uh, <clears throat> which is uh, the language, I think, is unique on, on the planet. Uh, we might say animals make sounds, but they really don't string together sentences, as far as I know. What about with kids? When, ki when, when, uh, when uh, babies are developing, do they go through some kind of a linguistic uh, abstracting They're able to hold concepts after a while, right? At first, they're not. Well, I mean, certainly there's large bodies of research sort of investigating the development of linguistics and the development of thought processes on children. And I think that's, you know, an area that is being more discovered about. Um, I guess I would take it in a different direction, what you've just brought up, which for me it's we do have the power of thought, which is before words. And we could say that that's, uh, you know, a gift that we have as humankind. We could also say that's our, our handicap. Um, you know, certainly in terms of a lot of people experiencing their own personal turmoil and, and often creating it in those around them is often created by the thoughts and the consequent actions that come from those thoughts and beliefs. What did so you mean by we have the power of thoughts before words? Is, a, is there a thought without a word? Well, there can be thought without word. 
and usually it's thought that creates word. So in terms of you know what I'm speaking here, it's you know arising somewhere out of my my thoughts or my mind, and then I'm putting it into action with my vocal cords, and it's coming out as words, and you're hearing me. And then it what seems that way. It seems that way when I'm uh, thinking of what to say, and then those thoughts create the words in that way, right? But in another way, I mean, the thoughts are made out of words, or they're made out of concepts. I don't know what. Is there a thought, I mean, without any kind of label, without any kind of emotion, without any kind of, is there such a thought as that? I, I, I don't know. I, mean, I couldn't Maybe testify to that. This level is, is too abstract and it's not very fun to talk about. You know, I don't like really hypothesizing about something and I can't really say with a definite experience, direct experience. And I don't really see it's that helpful to hypothesize in that way. Say again now. Say that one more time. I don't feel it's that helpful to just hypothesize how thought might work or does it work, what comes first, the chicken or the egg, so to speak. Um, I don't see it being of much help in terms of it's not my direct experience and I can't speak authentically from that. And I don't really see that it helps myself or you or anyone listening to mm. discuss or go down that train of thinking. Right, right. Now, I get you by the chicken and an egg, because, I mean, you know, that is somehow trying to uh, get to the root of the story we tell ourselves. And, uh, you know, in one sense, you can say that um, so much experience can come out of, a, out of a, th a thought pattern, because you can go to something artificial like a movie, and there's nobody there. There's only blotches of light and sounds, and you can have huge experiences. And it seems like all those experiences are generated out of your past or out of thought. Thought is, is something that's been around for a while. And uh, so then I wonder if we can just divide. I mean, you can tell us, I suppose, and that could be a good question. Can we divide our, uh, our experience from our thoughts? Are they, are they separate? Well, I think the most helpful thing is to become aware of your thoughts. What are you thinking? What are your beliefs? Because those, in fact, construct what we hear and therefore our experience and therefore our actions. If you're unaware of what your thinking process, what your belief process is, then in fact you're unautomatic. So then it's irrelevant whether it comes from your thought process or otherwise. And I do consider it, and, and certainly in my own work and my own personal experience, it's very possible to become aware of the layers of beliefs and thinking that construct who we are as a human being and our consequent interrelation with other people and the world around us. So that I see as being the most sort of productive avenue of exploration and something that every single person can do. Now, I'm, I, I'm not sure I'm really on the track, but uh, you're saying that uh, you can investigate thoughts and see what you believe, and then you can look under there, and somehow they can either deconstruct or at least they'll be in the open. Is that what you were saying? Correct. And when no, they're in the open, you can watch the process that they're, what, that they're just uh, how they kind of, make us un, uh, puppets. In other words, we're just uh, directed by, by some thought patterns that may or may not be of interest. Well, that's correct. You know, we might have certain beliefs or attitudes that have really constructed our picture of how the world is. So you and I can both look at the same picture and see different things, which is based on our individual particular programming of how our thoughts and beliefs and attitudes have been constructed. So to actually understand well, what is my programming, and that's the only responsibility I can do is look at mine. You can look at yours, and if we're both clearer, then we can have a more authentic communication. Can Otherwise, we, can we, we ever get to the bottom of, it, of our programming, or is it always kind of like uh, it's in a way endless, it's just a, a, a really big tapestry? On the one hand, I think, yes, it is, it is a big tapestry, but my personal experience is you come to a place where you realize 
that there is a you that is sort of in a way beyond thoughts. But until you've started to really understand the process and that, all the conditioning and beliefs and attitudes in a way, then you don't have that direct experience. Right. In other words, you just say, that tapestry is not me. <laughs> I could play with it for a lot, but... Richard, the thing is, Richard, most people say that they don't like the parts they don't like, and that's coming from the place of duality, which is coming from the place of their conditioning. So unless you've had a direct experience of acceptance of the whole, of the tapestry, and then having a direct experience of you, then you don't actually understand that there is another option. So how does it happen that you get a direct experience of that tapestry? Now, that we're, again, to say the tapestry we're saying is uh, like all our <clears throat> thoughts and beliefs and tendencies and what? Somehow just our cultural melu. But there's, you know, there's a whole, you know, mixture that contributes to our conditioning, to our, our matrix of all our thoughts and our beliefs, our conditioning of upbringing, culture, environment, experiences that we've had, pre-birth, after birth, and so on. I mean, the, how I look at it, if someone seriously wants to understand themselves and to have that process of self-discovery, you know, really it's the self-responsibility of, of looking. And anyone can do that at any time. It really takes the direct intention, some you know, circumstances, some processes can really be a support. So you say that anybody can take the responsibility to, of looking, of actually looking for, the, for their life, at their life. But in a way, isn't it helpful uh, to know from where you look? Because if you look from uh, a position of a lot of beliefs or preconceptions, uh, those preconceptions are probably reflected in what you see. And uh, I'm saying that it's, it's, again, the chicken and the egg, because uh, if you're in a calm and peaceful state, you can probably see really well. But if you're in a... I beg to differ on that. Okay. I work with um, you know, people in a variety of different circumstances. And to be honest, I'd say the person who's had the biggest crisis, the biggest shake-up in their life, and the biggest upset are the most likely to have the crack to see their conditioning and their belief systems more clearly. Now, I'm not saying that you have to have a crisis to um, see yourself more clearly, but often it is such a shake-up that one begins to see beliefs and attitudes and the constructs of the thinking patterns much, much more clearly. And I've seen this repeatedly over and over and over in the years I've worked with people. That's kind of like the, the culmination of the crisis, right? Where it all kind of cracks apart and it's just too much. But no, during the crisis, no, people aren't seen much, are they? No, during the crisis is often where the opportunity happens. Not necessarily the end point. It's the shake-up that often gives the opportunity. When people are calm and comfortable, their sense of comfort is often actually the the numbing machine. It's easier to stay comfortable and safe and secure. It's easy to just have the validation of what we already know. Well, that's really good news because, uh, you know, I guess I had a belief that it, it, a crisis had to kind of come to a point where it, it all just crumbled because, I mean, I'm just thinking of uh, maybe an alcoholic. Uh, somebody's in a crisis for 20 or 30 years and, and they might even be going to AA all the time and and still, somehow, they're not able, able to see. And somehow there's a feeling there or a mood, you know, like a depression or something that feels good to escape. And you can escape it by taking some kind of a chemical. And alcohol is one. And uh, they're not able to see it for years and years and years. I mean, is it, I mean, really, it comes down to the point is whether someone wants to see what gets shown in the crisis in someone's life will often give them the shake-up, the wake-up to look. Whether they choose to take that or not is going to be up to the individual person. Um, you use the example of an alcoholic, and you know, I have one person I know and worked with for a number of years, and he's really had a complete transformation. Um, and he was a chronic alcoholic for an extreme number of years. Um, 
you know, I, I don't really think it really matters what the person's background, what has happened in their life. You know, to me, that's actually all, all irrelevant. We all have the possibility to wake up to more of who we are. The choice is, is whether we listen to the taps on the shoulder when they come, whether it be quietly in meditation or whether it be life turning ourselves and our situation upside down, um, or whether it's just we watch something and it touches us, or we have some actually really wonderful opening experience in our life. It can be a wide variety. Um, I don't think there's any particular way, in fact, I don't think there is any, any way except really one's own personal path. You say taps on the shoulder, and uh, sometimes we talk about um, spiritual practice gives you a taste, which can be like a tap on the shoulder, you can notice something. Can be, can also for some people be another drug. I'm not feeling good, so I do my meditation, or I go off to my workshop and I feel a bit better. So I, I wouldn't put, you know, spirituality as being necessarily um, in itself the tap on the shoulder. How people use it, if they use it as indeed a serious way to look at themselves and their their beliefs and to wake up to more of who they are and their potential, then indeed it can be helpful. So maybe a common belief is that uh, all spiritual work or all spiritual practice is, is to get a taste of, of something, they would say, more real, right? But I mean, you're saying that that's so often misused or, or what? Uh, I'm not uh, saying it's so often. What I'm saying is the potential is there. We can use anything at all to, in a sense, to be a numbing effect. It's you know, really up to each individual to explore and to see for themselves what it is that they need to see. And, you know, it's to consider that you are actually achieving enlightenment because you're meditating every day. Indeed, could just be another belief that's actually keeping you stuck. You said to discover or to see what you need to see. And so then, what's the, where does that need come from? That is the crisis, right? And it creates a need. Otherwise, you don't feel, like you said, when you're uh, just happy and uh, complacent, uh, you, you feel no need to take a look. Yeah, that's true. Many people who are just you know, quite complacent and on a relative level happy, they may not look more deeply to see that there might actually be more to who they are and their potential. It often is a crisis, whether it be small, large, or medium, that gives us the, really, it's just the opportunity. It's sort of the, the knock on the door to say, you know, is that true, really? And then it's up to each individual to you know, ask the questions. And it's that sort of own self-discovery of peeling off the layers to reveal what's already here. It's in the name of your, your program that says, never not here, we're never not here. We are always here. I kind of uh, like to, uh, well, I started off the conversation the way I did, talking about abstractions as kind of a setup. And the setup was that uh, no matter how wide and varied the abstractions are, which are descriptions of life or, or a modeling of life, life can never be found in there. And so then that's kind of like, um, that's, uh, that's the, the great question is that, uh, we're looking for more life and we're trying to describe our life to find it. And yet the more we try to describe life, uh, the less our attention falls on our actual living of it. Correct. And so then, uh, we're talking, we're saying that there's some curiosity or some need or some uh, desire to know more of who I am, which would actually propel somebody away from conceptualizing just to see, well, what is this moment of life all about? This very simple moment of right now. And that's why I said, uh, that's probably what I, I was trying to say when I 
mentioned that uh, from where you're looking. So if you're looking from some place that's very simple, uh, it seems like your view is unobstructed. If you're looking from a very complex uh, array of uh, so-called problems and entanglements, it might be more difficult to see clearly. Well, that might be one of the beliefs that you might need to deconstruct. Right on. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> How does it work? How do you go about it? Does somebody have to acknowledge that uh, there's something that they want to see? Usually that's the first step. And, you know, usually for most people, the first step is I'm uncomfortable. And there must be more to life or to me than what I'm experiencing. So that's usually, not always, but usually the first step for many people. And then, you know, each person's path will be in a different way. Some might go through different, um, you know, spiritual practices or different types of therapy in that self-exploration. Others might do it in, in more on their own path, in their own way. Uh, but often what is involved and what is most helpful is the questioning. And the, one of the basic questions is, who am I? Um, and complementary to that is, what am I and what is life? And these are questions that often arise in people's minds, no matter their background, their culture, their environment, their upbringing. Um, but those that are you know, truly, in a sense, uncovering themselves back to their simplicity of here now, um, you know, tend to come across these questions. Of course, these are questions, if I understand, the, I mean, if I understand the whole thing uh, in any way, uh, these are questions that don't have answers in the sense they don't have abstract answers. Correct. They don't have they, conceptual they have, answers. They lead you, they're, they're keys, they're keys to direct experience of truth. And that's a real thing. Once you have a direct experience of truth for yourself, it's not a concept, it's an experience, it's yours. So is that a thought without words or is that not even a thought? That's not a thought. That's an experience beyond the thought. And I guess there's nothing to say about that experience because thought wasn't there while it was happening. And so it's not categorized or not, uh, not in the library in any sense. Well, you can always afterwards then put it into all sorts of categories and thinking about it. But once you've had an experience, it is indeed that and it stays with you no matter what thought does with it. So there's a huge uh, business, basically, of uh, guiding people to, to that experience. Now, whether that business really ever does it or not, I don't know, but it purports to do it, to guide people to uh, an experience of themselves. Or I said business, but I should just say activity, you know? I mean, because, like, I'm doing it myself, but I'm not a business since I'm not collecting any, any tariffs. It's a huge yeah, activity. It's there's a variety of things and if you know somebody hears this talk or one of your other talks and it touches and helps them wonderful if they participate in a workshop or a seminar and that helps them fantastic if they have another life situation their boss tells them they're fired their girlfriend or boyfriend says you know it's over different things can really support us to have those direct experiences um I guess what I would say to, to your listeners is there is no one way. It's really finding out for yourself. If you're attracted to something, you feel a tingle, you feel, oh, yes, I want to try that, then explore that, see if it works for you. Somehow there's a, it seems like there's an understanding quotient in there. Somewhere there's an understanding, or maybe that comes from this direct experience. You just see it. You know, that kind of understanding, not an understanding like a knowing or a, well, maybe that would be a knowing. I, 
we get wound up on those two words, understanding and knowing, like one is cerebral or uh, cognitive, and another one is experiential. And somehow there needs to be some kind of a knowing because, I mean, a lot of people uh, uh, spend many, many decades on some kind of a path, but always seem to be unfulfilled. Well, I think you're making a few suppositions there. I mean, it's um, you know, everyone's path is uniquely different. Maybe it is for some people years and years, and before they have a direct experience, maybe someone doesn't. Maybe they have it on their deathbed. Some people have it through near-death experiences. Some people have it, as I said, through crisis events. Some people have it just simply walking through the park or in the shower. You know, I, I tend not to um, overtly define as there is this way or that way. You know, I've heard too many experiences of people having awakening moments in such varied situations. Um, so that I guess this is why I encourage people to have a wider view. I do make the experience or the definition that it's not a cerebral understanding, it's not a concept, it is a direct experience, it's something you know with your whole, your whole being, your whole selves, it's something that no matter what thoughts you have afterwards, that experience doesn't leave you. It's so easy to, to construe that as an event. You know, when you're looking at life as a, as a series of concepts, then that becomes a concept, too, from outside. That's where a lot of people get a little bit stuck. They're trying to recreate uh, something they've heard about, or what you said at the beginning, they have a goal or an expectation. And those sort of things tend to arise from thought. And, you know, we can't stop thoughts. Thoughts are a part of who we are. They're part of being a human being. So I don't mean to sort of say that you, know, you need to start thought before you can have a direct experience, but by you know, really, in a sense, applying thought and you know, having that sort of inquiry, to have that self-discovery, it can be a support, but it's not necessarily the only way that you'll have an experience beyond thought. Many people say that that's uh, some kind of a grace or just a, a surprise. And whether it's related to what they had been doing before or not, uh, who knows? I mean, people that have never even uh, thought of any kind of a who am I or what's life all about, somehow a crack appears and they see something that they have never s seen before and that's beyond words and maybe that's what happens to all of us and whether we're uh, doing something uh, that we think is effective or not. This is one way to say it indeed. And my observation is that those who are on a, a deeper intent of really wanting to find out who they are they do seem to have a higher propensity of having those cracks or those experiences. So people come to you and like you said that uh, there's some need or some feeling that uh, life is incomplete and that's why they come. So you, that's uh, just by the fact that they're coming to you, that's a filter already that only those people that come that uh, have a sense that they need to talk it over. Well, those are the people that come to me. People who come to me are often in a time of wanting to have more clarity and more input to see themselves more clearly whether it be from something that's more uncomfortable in their life or 
just a general feeling that there's something more that they would like to experience. And sometimes just to have a reflection, you know, in terms of where they are on their track. Um, but you know, I don't, I don't see all people on the planet. There's about seven billion of us near, thereabouts. Uh, you know, so there's a wide, wide variety that I may not even come across. I tend to um, have quite a broad outreach of people that I meet, not just through my work, but also in my engagement in life. So I, I think I can speak from a relatively broad sense of different types of people, cultures and backgrounds. That's very interesting because uh, a lot of time, uh, times I ask, uh, is this cross-cultural? The same seeking or the same um, discontent? Uh, many cultures maybe are could be considered oppressed, and then most of their attention goes to relieving that oppression. And so maybe they may be um, asking, what's this, what, what is this thing I call me? Uh, maybe that's a luxury, uh, or I, don't, I don't know. It's a, it, but when you say cross-cultural, that would be uh, nice to have a few comments about if this is um, a universal I think our cerebral exploration of consciousness in our Western environment is definitely, as you put, a luxury. Um, you know, working as I do with people in countries where the basic survival is not even covered, there isn't much luxury uh, to dedicate in, in the cerebral understanding. Um, however, there is in, in the cultures that I've come across, which is mostly in Southeast Asia. Uh, you know, very much a desire to understand the nature of consciousness. Not necessarily the way or even the terminology how we put it in the Western environment, but there is a deeper innate cultural knowing that there is actually something more. Um, and, you know, my experience of you know, meeting shamans from many different cultures in the world, it's, you know, throughout most cultures is the... On the one hand, we might say the belief or the tradition that there is something greater, a greater potential that we can aspire to. So I think that is indeed cross-cultural. The approach to it, however, is can be quite different. And as I said, our Western version of it does seem to be excessively cerebral, which is also the nature of how we've developed in our Western culture, with our education, with our emphasis on the thinking processes. I think that could be quite interesting to uh, to see what could cross over. And you talked about shaman, shamans uh, in in different cultures. Uh, do they? I mean, they don't have a practice like uh, we do in the West. Or what's their position in society? Or uh, uh, and what's their outreach? Or how many people come to a shaman? Or uh, I mean, it depends, obviously, in the situation and the environment and. Um, one effect that I've noticed in my travels is, you know, many cultures are actually being quite, uh, what I put, contaminated with our Western uh, influence, which is largely through the media and, of, and the access to television and radio. Um, so a lot of the, what we might call more traditional cultures are becoming more... Um, how can we say a bit more mixed up, not, not as how they were. In a lot of the communities that I have traveled, the shaman takes the role really as the, as the leader and as a spiritual leader. Um, often they're considered someone who is the keeper of higher knowledge, the one that is the one that can guide people through challenges. Um, and in my experience, the many that I've met her, have definitely had their own direct and authentic experiences of a more awake state and you know in a very different ways you know, I wouldn't say that there's any one thing that I could say is the same in all of them because obviously each one is in a very different cultural environment once again but I would say as a generalization that the shamans that I've come across 
has certainly still been considered quite, um, in one form or another, leaders in the community. I suppose the only ones that we hear about in the West are the ones that are in, uh, you know, peyote cultures or uh, or have some kind of a drug or some something that the uh, Western man might want to go and go for, you know. And so then we think mm -hmm, that might be what it's all about. Mm -hmm. uh, ayahuasca, I guess they call this uh, this. And you hear a shaman, that's what you think of uh, as a Western. But I mean, we don't. Re I mean, I had, I'm the first to admit my total ignorance of of uh, spirituality and other cultures. Well, I think that's uh, probably true for a lot of your listeners. And you know, as you said, there might be a lot of stereotypes in terms of what they might think when they uh, think of the shaman. And you know, my experience having met a number of them in different um, situations in, 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 in situ, so to speak, is they often live actually also very ordinary lives in amongst the community. But when it comes to matters of serious consequence, um, whether it be law and order or a disagreement that's happened or a spiritual matter, um, often also it includes healing in terms of both physical healings and also mental and psychological healing, then it's the, the shaman that is called upon. But you know, they might also call him out of the field, he might be planting rice or you know, digging up roots or just doing something that you might see any other normal villager also doing. So I think the, the stereotypical idea of the, the shaman just you know, sitting in some exalted state, um, some drug-induced trip, I think, is actually inaccurate. And even the shamans of the Amazon who work with ayahuasca, they said actually have been brought up in that tradition. Um, from what I've understood is they also have quite a long training on many, many different aspects, not just the use of the drug itself in specific shamanic purposes. I think there's a Western view that uh, uh, breaking apart your normal consciousness, your normal conscious structure, which somehow this mechanism we have is a receiver of that, let's say, and chemically altering that receiver, somehow that is, uh, can be, let's say, equal to the experience that you talked about, an experience of who you are, or maybe an experience of who you aren't if everything that you thought you were breaks apart and just starts drifting off in different directions and you say whoa and that's not too solid but uh i don't know that's that's not uh, really the experience you're talking about no and i i don't advocate drug use as in any form as a way of actually truly having an authentic experience of truth It seems that the drug use is just a, a, another way to get away, f or the numbing, or I don't know. I'm not a drug user, so I can't. <laughs> somebody's going to say, no, 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 it's not that way at all. <laughs> well, but, of course, it's going to be unique for every person. And, you know, it, it certainly for some people, maybe they have a glimpse or a little bit of an opening. Um, having had my own experiences in my past, I certainly use drugs as a form of numbing. Um, you know, I had too much pain and it was too much to really deal with, so I use drugs as a form of numbing personally. Um, so I speak from my personal viewpoint of, of drugs, but also having you know, seen a number of people and also having, you know, spoke of machines, the use of drugs, although they are used as a glimpse, they don't replace, in a sense, doing the, the real homework. Um, of awakening oneself. Be here now. That's all there is. On one level, it's very, very simple. So, uh, what came to me when you said uh, some of these shamans are just very simple people doing very simple things, whether they're out in the fields digging or 
And so then I thought, well, the shaman in all of us is, is just this very simple person. Uh, here, this is where the shaman is, just in the very simple sitting in a chair or, you know, being in front of a person or smiling or, or you know, some words come and sometimes words don't come. I think we can say just on a very general level who we are is a very simple person, full stop. <laughs> Let's not put a label of it being a shaman. Right. The label just means that like uh, the inner knowing, the inner knowing of each of us is very simple. And I guess always here. True. And again, I, I just in encourage you not to put any label on it. Because again, it puts separation. Media is something we're doing now. We're making a movie and, and we're, mm -hmm. we're on, uh, we're on a media too. Our hookup is kind of long distance. Absolutely. And uh, so media sometimes works good at, uh, generally thought to work best in a cerebral way, right? I mean, you can talk about things and you can s make distinctions. And sometimes you can say that all those distinctions aren't that important. And so then you can talk, uh, you know, you can, you can take the wind out of some distinctions and that's also cerebral. And then you can guide each other to some kind of experiential or some kind of felt sense too, and just say, see, feel this stillness. And uh, whether they're that much separate, uh, uh, or whether it's all it's all life. Well, it is all life, you know, Richard. It depends really where someone puts their attention. I mean, as you said, we're using the media here, and if someone's listening and they feel really touched or they can do something wonderful. Um, they get upset. It's the same thing. Um, but there's also you know, a lot of different types of media and it can, can and is being used in a variety of different ways now. And there's, you know, obviously there's a sharing of knowledge, a sharing of information. There is also the sharing of um, you know, facts that really previously weren't so accessible before. You know, the recent sort of in happenings in the Middle East and what is being able to be communicated you know, from the ground live from a large and very number of people rather than just the mainstream media news allows us as individuals all around the world to be touched by something that maybe we wouldn't ever have had the experience of. So there is different possibilities in, in a variety of different ways. I wouldn't put it all as being just cerebral at all. So in that sense, it, it allowed a certain critical mass or a certain uh, mass consciousness that was disconnected. Or at one time, the connection of the mass consciousness, well, at one time, it was only through the cathedrals and the paintings on the walls. That was the mass consciousness. At another time, is the newspapers or the, the news or the, the line that the news puts out somehow makes our connections. And they're quite filtered connections, whereas this, uh, this media, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Egyptian connection was uh, much less filtered. And uh, so it was more authentic of a connection and it was a more authentic uh, critical mass of humanity that actually uh, made itself felt. It, it somehow was allowed to, uh, to manifest. Indeed, that's one of the, the benefits of technology is allowing us to be in touch with one another in a way that wasn't as easily available before. And probably because it wasn't available, we didn't even want it. You know, we had no idea that we would even want to be connected with that many people and say, no, keep me apart, you know, I want to live in my little fence. <laughs> well, I think... You know, one thing I, I would just encourage you, I, I, I hear you often making comments that to me come across as being um, from your belief system, your point of view. 
and that might not be true for someone you know, in Egypt or someone in India. They might have a completely different spin or, or, or viewpoint on that same point. Give an example if you would. Well, you just talked about the fact that someone you know, might not want to be connected. That they might say, no, that's too much, I don't want that. But from what I'm seeing, particularly in my travels in Asia, is the desire and the wish to want to be connected is, is really strong. And that's much more a part of their culture. It's the sense of interconnectivity is already there. The sense of um, having a level of openness and knowing and knowledge about everyone in the community, it sort of transposes in that for them. Then it's a bit like, yes, we want to be in touch with everybody. That's a, a very different viewpoint, for example, than some people have a more Western background and view and exposure to media that they've had or growing up all their life. I just had a chance to be in a school and I was offering uh, to do some videos and let people just talk from the heart or otherwise uh, read a poem or tell what they're doing in school. And uh, I, was, I was surprised that uh, no one over the age of 10 really wanted to get involved, you know, they wanted to keep their, their privacy circle going. And uh, mm -hmm. so then they were really kind of like suspicious. And uh, uh, we're looking to keep themselves uh, uh, hidden. But that's very, what I would call very typical of the U.S. culture. Yeah, I, I agree. And if you know, I do the same in Nepal, for example, where I'm regularly, um, <laughs> I have to be really careful that I'm, uh, you know, I can have barely hold the camera anymore because I've gone being swamped with so many kids. Uh -huh. Both to be on the screen and behind the screen. Well, the five-year-olds were like that. <laughs> they were really <laughs> all over that camera. <laughs> I'm talking about the 15-year-olds and 16-year-olds as well. Uh huh. And again, you know, we have a lot of different cultural backgrounds in different countries, in our different environments. And unless you've really traveled and spent time outside of that, you don't realize how much you believe that you are what you are, and it's simply your cultural conditioning, the fear base, or the opening points that your particular culture imposes. It's like, you know, being the fish in water, you don't realize that there's water. When you're out of the water, you suddenly realize there's a whole different world. Right. So that you know, uh, I'm a big advocate of encouraging um, all people, all ages, but certainly the you know our, our younger generation for you know taking a year off here and there and just really traveling and really living in different cultures, and not just staying in the tourist areas, but get to know, go and live in the communities, spend some time, find out for yourself. It's a very very quick and very fun and very easy way of seeing yourself completely. I totally agree. I had that experience of living in Italy for over a decade. And so then uh, I never was the same. <laughs> I never could be the same after that. And I really never could really uh, make a concept out of it. You know, mm -hmm. it doesn't really... Uh, compute as a, as an average or somehow uh, a little bit of this and a little bit, what's the best of this and what's the best of that. Somehow it's just totally different and I'm sure uh, in Southeast Asia it must be very much different. And uh, I heard, you know, I heard stories of, uh, from old hippies uh, even traveling through Iran in the 60s and that how that every village they were taken in and everybody was curious of who they were and, and they wanted to connect you know that was kind of like a human condition back then of just a, a very openness and a very connectedness and a very take you into the family and feed you and uh, and uh, you know just really who is this guy anyhow <laughs>
So I don't know if the world is, when you say the world is getting westernized, then maybe it's fragmenting and, uh, and taking on more, uh, more boundaries. Well, I, think, I think I can honestly say from my experience, it hasn't become totally westernized. And I think that there will be some aspects of other than Western culture that uh, indeed might prevail in the longer term. We're in a time of what I call a, a much greater change and mix up on the planet generally. And uh, I think we've got quite a few more years yet to see what indeed might come out. So when we speak of consciousness and also consciousness in the uh, developing world, I mean, this is a force of, this is kind of like a, an anti-force for the big business or globalization. Or, I mean, uh, this is the balance. Can you say something like that? I'm not quite sure I understood your statement there. Well, I mean, uh, we speak about the third world has their own mentality or or their own easiness with their their own mentality which is i would call it consciousness maybe or maybe you could and uh so then that's kind of like a force that that pulls people together and some other forces in the world tear people apart or create more boundaries and uh, maybe we could join forces with that and just feel like how to come together. I think I look on it a bit more simplistic Richard I think you know we're in a big cooking pot and it's got lots of different ingredients and it's still cooking and we don't know what it's going to turn into. <laughs> To me, that's a, the, probably the more realistic and, and easier way to look at it. If we put too much concepts on it, then I, you know, I, my experience is that limits what can happen because we're, we've got this sort of lid which is created by our concept instead of being with the, you know, what's really organically arising, what is really here now. I saw a concept that I on YouTube that I kind of really and really liked, and uh, and I put it on our website. But it was something about uh, I I forgot the name actually, but it, let's say it was girl power. But the idea was that in uh, so much of the world, uh, there's such a poverty that uh, girls, when they're 12 years old, are in a way married off just to get the dowry, to get a couple of cows or something like that. And so then when uh, they're either, let's say they're married off uh, and then by the time they're 13 or 14, they're having their first child. And so the idea was, the concept was that uh, if these girls were given a responsibility at the age of 12, uh, which was a cow, <laughs> they said, uh, let's give all the 12 year old girls a cow. And then with that responsibility, they would have a little milk and sell some and feed the family and uh, maybe go to school for a couple more years, which would keep maybe uh, their child be bearing, at, uh, would, would slow it down for two or three years, which would be huge. And by the time they're 18 and gone through school, they would have control of their own life and they, and they wouldn't be just a baby machine. And uh, they and uh, it would really uh, be a huge positive force in those developing worlds. But you're involved in education, are you not? I am. I'm also very much involved in the application in the field of microcredit, which is similar along the lines of what you're saying, which is really helping to provide people of um, low income or no income situations, the opportunity for creating their own income. And one of the 
very positive side effects of that is indeed education because that is something that does help the women in particular to realise that they do have different choices that they can make. And it is having a very large impact. The microcredit is reaching around the world hundreds of millions of women of all ages. And of course the women are the ones who can educate their children. So even if it's older women, they can also have an influence in their daughters and also their sons. So there is what we might call slow movements spreading in the world that perhaps are not as obvious and not under the normal umbrella of consciousness, yet nonetheless really having a very direct impact on the lives of people. And that's what I consider this is another piece in the cooking pot. I mean, personally, I look on it, I live my life, I follow where I'm drawn, I get involved in things that, um, to me, make a difference. Not from an idea of wanting to change the world or make a difference, but just what comes from my own heart. Where am I drawn? What's my passion? What's my aliveness? And that, for me, is the fun part. And I get to be, in a sense, a part of what's happening by really... In a sense, being here now, being with what's coming up. And um, it's pretty amazing, actually. It's kind of a start of something big because if one girl uh, uh, somehow gets through school, you can be sure that her daughter is going to go through school, too. I mean, she, it's not going to regress. It's, uh, it's like a, a turning point. Yes and no. I mean, you've seen the regression that's happening in our Western culture. There's more and more children actually turning away from school when they come to the legal limit of where they have to go to school. They're choosing not to. Um, you know, I think that it, you know there is education. There's education. There is the education that can help you understand more about life and living it. And then there's a more redundant education which just helps to develop thought and concepts. I don't see that as being that helpful. It's not to negate that you know, thinking processes can help develop and implement innovations that can help humanity. But I don't necessarily advocate that that's the only way of education. Having had the experience on the ground, what I'm seeing is women, especially now second generation women, really supporting their daughters and their sons to live in a way that really, in a sense, incorporates more knowledge of, of life outside of what they've been conditioned and brought up with. So again, it comes back to what we were talking about earlier, understanding what the limits of the beliefs and attitudes that we're brought up with. So the girl who before believed once she's married, that's it, she has to have babies, once she's had the awareness that actually, no, life doesn't happen like that. She's got different options. She's moving outside of that paradigm of limited beliefs. So it really comes back to what I call sort of naturalness. Once we understand what are imposed limitations and we start to access something wider, that's true knowledge. That to me is what I call real education. So maybe education is not so much about the content, but just the process that you investigate something you're interested in. Absolutely. And then the, the content might just be, uh, in a way, propaganda at first. Uh, propaganda for our society or our culture. Or, for instance, like uh, this guy, what's his name? Greg Mortensen, I think, or something like that. That's uh, in... in uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan. Afghanistan ma making many, many schools. And we don't know what the content of that is. You know, I mean, maybe we have donated to that. I think my wife has, but uh, we don't know what they're teaching there, but we're just happy that the, the process is there and that they're not in a kind of like a more medieval, uh, you know, being married off when they're 13 type of thing. But, but it can be a door to actually help the young women and also the, the, the boys. That's not limited to just women. Again, to help them understand something beyond 
the limitations of the cultural beliefs and attitudes. And I think where we're a little bit handicapped in the West is we believe our beliefs and that too is a limitation. And you know, there is now very high propensity in our Western environments of depression and various other chronic diseases which you know, are often symptoms of us living an unhealthy life. So I wouldn't say we need to aspire towards the, the Western orientation. But again, we're in a cooking pot, <laughs> putting it all in the mix and seeing what comes out. It's kind of funny because, like you said, we believe our beliefs, but one of our beliefs is that uh, other cultures believe their beliefs, you know, to the extreme, when we're, especially when we're talking about fundamentalism. People believe their beliefs, uh, and I guess that's worldwide also. It's one of the reasons we have many wars. When you talk about microfinance, I guess we all think about Bangladesh. And that's a kind of one f famous story that, uh, of a uh, phone ladies and uh, different uh, different programs that have uh, seemed to have created miracles there. It has definitely. The thing that blows my mind about microfinance is, you know, at first you th I, you, you, a Western person would be skeptical because I just refinanced my house. It was like $2,000 just to do the paperwork. But then I guess there's no paperwork on a, on a microfinance. It's kind of like an honor system, almost. Is that correct? Well, there is, you know, a level of paperwork. And you know, depending on the organization, depending on the country, it's varied and different. But what is there, it comes back to a much more basic level of the application of you know, borrowing and lending of money and the repayment of it, whereas now more westernized systems, we've developed the layers of bureaucracy to such an extent that it does cost, as you say, several thousand dollars. Um, if you bring that back to the simplistic and community managed model, which a lot of the microfinance is, it does indeed come back to the basic on a system which we've moved more away from. There are, however, a growing number of cooperatives and more holistic banks that have survived and in a, in a way actually really blossomed through the recent economic crisis that are operating on those basic principles in our Western environments. You know, you know, I mean, if you would think about the West and say, well, let's go into the poor neighborhoods and give everybody, you know, if somebody wants 200 bucks to do a little thing or 2,000, let's give it. But I, don't, I couldn't imagine that any of it would get repaid, zero. You well, know? then you but have to how, do the how does it happen that, the, that, the, that, you know, there's a huge difference in consciousness that... that uh, Richard, you're, you've got, in, even in America, you've got in, the, in the, the ghettos of New York, you've got microfinance operating. It's happening in nearly all of the major cities in the world. It's actually something that has spread from the emerging markets back to our Western environment. And it works. And it works. Mm -hmm. You've got the, the Grameen, which started in Bangladesh. You've got it well and truly in the US of A. Google research and you might see actually how, how spread out it is. Well, I heard, uh, you know, I heard this lady that started Kiva and I heard her speak about uh, that she wanted to uh, do family lending or something like that or make a plan where uh, people could get uh, venture capital instead of going to banks and capitalists. They could just uh, make a structure with family members, but... I don't know, I thought it was kind of risky <laughs> thinking about who I would be lending my money to. But again, your, your beliefs set come literally from your beliefs, your thoughts, your, your fears, um, from your experience that you've had. Yeah, when from I've, the experience that I've had. I've lent a lot of money out. and I know in Italy I did too. I lent money, <laughs> I, I, I got zero repayment, <laughs> but it didn't stop me from going at it. Ha, 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 ha.
So the world is so wide that uh, there's so many choices to make and and you don't really have to have a, a concept of winning on those choices. You can just make them because you like to make them. You don't have to, they don't, you don't have to make them dependent on a certain outcome. And uh, then that's kind of like what you're saying is that we're in a big cooking pot, put a few ingredients in there and it might not be the soup you were thinking about. <laughs> well, I think it comes back to the point, Richard, that we all have an individual life path. And you know, together we all make the tapestry of this human experience. And there's no right way and consequently there's also no wrong way. We're, we're all a part of the mix. And, uh, you know, it's by people experimenting and doing things that we have new things that are emerging on the planet. planet. Some are what we might call, you know, beneficial. Some we might say, well, I don't think that is. Um, you know, it's really, again, back to the individual to really look at his or her choices. And, you know, there'll be some people that say, no, I don't want to look. That's also their choice. That's a part of the mix. What's coming to me is just to make choices to make because you want to and not because you'll get something. And so then that, that something that, uh, you know, I did this because, that because can melt away because it doesn't always come out anyhow. <laughs> and then uh, uh, just be a part of the, the grand mix. And Indeed, expectations definitely cause mischief to the mind. So as you say, to make your choices without expectations is probably a much healthier idea. Um, and that, you know, that really is up to you know, each of us to look at that and see if it's true. Personally, I find it's a much better way to go about life is you know, making choices because that feels right for me and still including others in the world around me, but really to not do it because or I will get a reward, therefore that tends to cause a few more complications and upsets and heartbreaks. You know, I, uh, I got into a university setting this, this winter and uh, I was attracted to business studies about something they call sustainability. Mm -hmm. And sustainability, in a way, uh, it, came, it came to me that it's a word that's just being developed because it's like uh, a real key to living, mm -hmm. uh, in a way, but we don't know what it means yet. You know, we're just uh, trying to think that it means uh, recycling or something like that, or using less energy, or re renewable energy. Or, but I mean, I guess sustainability is really about the world uh, living together. and and being better off than it was yesterday. Instead, it seems like we're degrading so many things as far as the environment and uh, resources and uh, uh, er certain urgencies of uh, energy usage and energy production and, uh, and, and human rights. There seems to be, we are creating a lot of urgencies. And this whole idea of sustainability is really what uh, uh, is, is a topic that we can actually develop and see exactly where will it go. Uh, and it's, certainly it goes into uh, 4 billion people that are living on the edge, you know, and that have been ignored by the, uh, the Western society and ignored by the commercial structures in a way. Uh, maybe two thirds of humanity is, is kind of like written off and that's a huge uh, <laughs> oversight. <laughs> yes. By those people that think they're controlling the world. <clears throat> and so sustainability is also uh, how to bring uh, a better life to, uh, to a uh, poor village. And uh, whether that's uh, some kind of an income uh, potential or whether it's uh, more education, which is 
or whether it's uh, a connectivity or a feeling that uh, when we want to be connected, uh, all these things somehow are inclusive and so and bring us together. Well, I think one of the points that to me is, is a very relevant one on this subject is sustainability is basically a whole world concept in essence. It cannot be just that we apply sustainability to poor communities. Um, that's a, a very limited usage of it. Um, you know, we need to create a sustainable world economy as such in terms of how we utilise and work with the resources we have. That's, as I see it, it's a potential which could be more useful for you know, all nearly 7 billion of us rather than you know, having it skewed, as you said, the way that it is with 4 billion having much less and 3 billion of us having much more. Um, I mean, certainly as yourself doing the studies that you are, if other people and you know, people like myself who are getting more directly involved in field work and, and communicating to others about it, maybe it does make a difference. Maybe we create a more sustainable whole life. I think, it, in my view, it also comes back to the individual in terms of looking at the choices we each make. And consequently, again, it comes back to what are our beliefs and attitudes. Um, so that, to me, is all a part of helping to create a sustainable life experience within oneself as well as our wider community. Um, and I think in many respects, our more westernised cultures, many people are quite unaware of how unsustainable indeed that is. So just generally sharing knowledge, you know, maybe you're doing a feature just on that. How unsustainable are we? You know, if you look at our electrical supplies, our you know, day to day living, it's actually very, very unsustainable. And what would it mean to be sustainable? What would that what changes might that mean? What um, beliefs and attitudes might that mean shifting? So there's uh, quite a broad topic to bring right. <laughs> Because like uh, one belief could be that we'd all have to reduce, right? Because I can't be sustainable. Another belief could be, I mean, you could say, hey, well, I'll put solar panels on my, on my roof and uh, I'll turn all the lights on and keep them going all the time, you know, because uh, energy is free. I mean, there's a very wide variety if you really break down what do we have in our day-to-day -day life. And, you know, there's, I mean, this is a subject I could talk for quite some length that is something I've actually given a lot of thought to and uh, exploration of my own sort of beliefs and lifestyle. Again, being exposed to different cultures and different environments, it can make you much more aware of how dependent we can become on you know, simply just having a, a regular supply of electricity. You know, here we are talking by Skype in our comfortable living homes. I imagine you've got your light on there in the background, as you can see I have. Um, but I spend four months of the year in the fall where having electricity is not guaranteed. You know, there, I was there just recently and having 12 hours of electricity in a 24-hour period is normal at that particular time of the year. And you don't necessarily know when the electricity is going to come in that 24 hours. So you don't have the normalcy of turning on a light or turning on a computer, having a refrigerator, being able to cook when you want, you actually have to design your life differently because of the circumstances and lack of resources. And uh, I think if um, indeed we had a few disruptions in our Western environments, we start we might start to realise that perhaps our lifestyles are not sustainable as we tend to think they are. <laughs> that reminds me of something I remember. I remember, let's see, let's see, how long ago was this? This was in the late 60s, in 69, let's say. I went to England and I went to call someone up and I couldn't get the line. 
and I was totally freaked out. Like I'd never, never happened to me where I would pick up a phone and the line wouldn't be there. <laughs> that was a total breakthrough. I was actually in uh, India in, uh, two years ago, and so then mm -hmm. I and I adapted. You know, I I did all my work on. I did a lot of um, recordings, but I did everything on battery because some in, inevitably in the middle of a recording the power would go out, mm -hmm. and so brownouts were quite common. So just a question to you: Were you using rechargeable batteries or? Well, camera batteries, you know, they're all rechargeable. Yeah, the camera batteries. Right. I, I just asked that question because one of the, the downsides of being without electricity is often when people use batteries in a variety of different forms, which is contributing enormously to the pollution waste. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking more specifically in Asia, although it's not limited to that. Yeah, that's all. And that's always a big uh, problem because they, n nowadays they, there was a time when they would just sell two or four batteries together. Now they sell these 15 packs or 24 packs, you know, and I'm wondering what's going on with all these batteries. And you hear that they're, you're supposed to not supposed to throw them in the trash. And so then I've saved them, but there's really no place to put them. <laughs> and they just did it. <laughs> they're just in a bag somewhere turning green. <laughs> I, I do have the luxury of living here in, in Berlin, in Germany, where they have very good recycling programs, including for batteries, um, electrical equipment, and so forth. So they really have put thought into that part of it. But this doesn't really deal back to your original topic of sustainability. You know, that's basically putting a Band-Aid on you know, what is, in essence, an unsustainable lifestyle that we're, we're currently choosing to create. So I heartily encourage you to do further um, talks and discussions on the topic of sustainability and bring more you know, just knowledge awareness because the more we become aware and have different experiences for ourselves and share that with friends and with family, then it indeed does, does spread around. I ha this is my drive, actually. This is kind of like where I want to go. It's kind of like... Uh Okay, Never Not Here started uh, talking basically to Papaji uh, mm -hmm. disciples four or mm -hmm. five years ago. And then we were talking so much about always consciousness and really in a way saying that, uh, you know, there's the conceptual and there's the heart way and stuff like that. But I mean, basically it was all conceptual uh, or received that way. It was received as a concept. Because let's say somebody uh, can, like even you, are talking about an experience, but mm, somebody that hasn't had that experience is taking that as like an event or a concept or I can get there or it's kind of like a goal. And uh, I, I've been doing that for three or four years and now I just some, somehow want to get, get on the ground and get some traction. And uh, I have a, a kind of a... A plan to maybe get into an uh, an industrial commission in uh, in Chicago, which is uh, somebody that stimulates new businesses. And so mm -hmm. then, how to stimulate a new business and get it to last? It should be in some way sustainable. Uh, how is it going to have an advantage on an old business? or, you know, just what somebody else is doing. And there, somehow, uh, sustainability should be a, a very large topic of consideration. And uh, maybe I'll really get involved with that. I don't know. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll give you some uh, homework. Oh, yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> I suggest that you read the most recent two books of Muhammad Yunus, the founder of the Grameen model in Bangladesh. And he's written two books specializing on what he calls social business, which is looking at the topic of sustainability from a very holistic perspective. And he's certainly a person that I admire greatly and um, have thankfully had the opportunity to meet him personally and find him an extraordinary human being. And the level of sort of consciousness and action that um, 
I find uh, both inspiring, admirable, and uh, very heartening. It gives me the, the courage of what can really unfold if the human being really follows what feels right in a really com a compassionate way that's actually really in action. And uh, my guess is if you're interested in this topic, as you've said, you'll find these books both very inspiring as well as very good guidelines for certainly outreaching the endeavour you're talking about. Say it again, like uh, I know Eunice, when I kind of like uh, studied Grameen Bank and I, I studied a little bit about his uh, his uh, micro lending and financing, and then uh, and then the the telephone thing, where he got mm -hmm. a, a one or two telephone ladies in, in a whole bunch of villages and increased the connectivity of of uh, and also made income for them and and the studies where that income went was into the education of the of that those ladies' kids and it all went into the community. And I studied some other kind of different things that were supposedly, you know, called sustainable in a way. I mean, I think there was one about, that I recall, of a, a denim mill, a huge mill that wanted to sell Levi's. And instead of selling Levi, trying to make a cheap set of Levi's for, uh, for poor people in villages, they made a Levi's kit which they cut the denim to the pattern and put the zipper and the buttons in there and then sold those to the local tailors, all the yeah. village tailors. And so then they were the assemblers. Mm -hmm. They assembled those, uh, those clothings. And uh, so then that added to their income too. And that, I thought that was kind of like a miracle or like a very interesting. So I studied some of that. But when you say Eunice's new books, I mean, are, are more like the totality of... Uh, or the uh, the play of consciousness and sustainability, or I mean, is ex is it's expanded from just a story of his uh, successes? Correct. There's an expansion, and what he's I mean, just in a very short nutshell, it's really developing businesses that first have a a goal to provide a service or product that the community really needs, that really. Um, for example, one has been the provision of affordable footwear. One of the problems, in, particularly in Bangladesh, is a particular type of worm parasite that comes up through the feet and the feet being exposed barefoot in situations particularly damp where the, um, the worm enters the foot. So providing cheap and affordable footwear that everyone can wear is a product and a service to the community. The development of the business and the business model is such that all the employees are provided, everyone involved in the provision of that service or product are paid a fair wage, are paid in a, a working conditions are appropriate and that the goal isn't about making profit but the goal is about the provision of the service. So the investors may get um, you know, a return back or their, their capital returned in full. So it's actually operating on a more sustainable business operations. But instead of it, in commercial business where a business is normally operated to provide the shareholders with a capital return, and the higher the capital return, the better, the social business is orientated in the provision of the service and working conditions that really benefit everybody. And so the orientation of the whole business is, is quite different. But the, the idea is still to run it as a business to, for the provision of services and of products and goods. So that's just a very, very short summary. And right, so those are foundations, right? They're not uh, traditional commercial businesses. Yes, no, I'm talking about traditional commercial businesses, except the emphasis is not on providing the majority of the emphasis back to the shareholders. The emphasis is on the provision of the product and service. Well, the, the, the new business schools are talking, they talk about something called BOP, bottom of the pyramid, which means those four billion people making five bucks or a day or less. and. Uh, I guess originally they just started to uh, try to package their goods in a way that could be consumed. You know, like I think the first were soap companies. 
and they would make single use packages for laundry soap or something like that. And then uh, what, of course, what I said, uh, the, the example I gave of the uh, denim mill, uh, mm -hmm. they provided a product that actually gave some employment and, you know, put some of the money into the community. They weren't just saying, okay, take my little soap packages and give me your money. You know, you got $5 a day, give me 50 cents. <laughs> No, but they're saying, how can we put money into the uh, into the village? And the same with Grameen or the the the, uh, the deal with the phones, where he got uh, cell phones in in all the villages, and somehow they uh, those ladies would get a few cents a call and make maybe three hundred dollars a month. I don't know, a month or a year. <laughs> I don't remember. But anyhow, they would uh, money would go into the community actually, and and and. And that's really the kind of like what they're talking about is uh, sustainable, uh, how to make the community a, a part of the of the product. Correct. And what Eunice is doing with the, what he's calling the social businesses is, again, it's very much community-based. And so people are involved in terms of the workers facilitating the building of the factories, the running of them, the employees, the way that the products are actually sold all include the elements that you've just talked about. But the biggest essential difference is the emphasis is on the delivery of an affordable product, not on a return of capital to the shareholder, which 99% of businesses that are commercially operating in the world are more orientated on that operation. So this is providing a product that is of real need, for example, the shoes prevent the parasitical worms. Another uh, example of the social business is with the um, Danone yogurt, which is a, a particular type of yogurt that is enhanced with vitamins and minerals and sold at a very affordable um, price and it's also a very yummy taste to really help the nutritional aspect of malnutrition that's happening in Bangladesh. So they're sort of two examples of creating a sustainable business that actually really supports itself. It generates, it allows it to keep growing, allows it to employ people, it allows it to generate income in the communities, as well as providing a service that's not dependent on aid. So it's not dependent on um, a foreign organisation or government having to keep putting money in, which is not a very reliable way of delivering of real support to a community in a sustainable way. So we're just talking about choices, you know, and we're talking about choices without an expectation or without conventional expectations, like the conventional expectation of uh, doing a service is to get a profit. And so then... Correct. So then uh, it's kind of like what we were talking about in consciousness when we were talking about that. It's just making a choice during the day uh, that didn't really depend on, on uh, some kind of a abstract notion of what's going what's to be the process and what's going to be the outcome. And Which again comes back to the limiting beliefs and attitudes. You know, I was at a conference where Muhammad Yunus was a speaker talking on this topic. And it was fascinating to, to watch the amount of um, sort of opposition to what he was saying in terms of how the questions and what questions were posed that were really being driven from how people's conditioned thoughts of what was possible and not possible. Do you mean in the Q&A? Correct. So people were having a hard time digesting, well, how would this ever work? <laughs> The good news is that he has um, very successfully put them into, into um, operation and that's why I recommend having a read of his books that shares of his journey with it, the, the ups and downs, the learning experiences and uh, you know, gives a, a different viewpoint into the subject. So as you mentioned your interest in it and I, as I said I advocate some homework for you. <laughs> Great. Isn't that like a... Uh what is a limitation of our life it, is that, that we're, we're, we have those say in, the, in our Q&A, <laughs> internal Q&A, we're saying, how will that ever work? And that won't work. <laughs> and then we... That's what I was coming back to when you were talking about thought. <laughs> yeah. 
So then when we give up a few of those uh, uh, doubts and just to make choices that feel right for us, uh, maybe life unfolds in a, in a beautiful way. Was having the courage to live from that. You know, my personal experience is that it works wonderfully. You know, I've lived and am living an amazing life because I've had the courage to follow those sort of inner guidances and intuitions that have happened in my life. And uh, for that, I'm really grateful. I've had enough experience now to know that it works for myself. And, of course, I encourage others to live that way. Let's say how you can make some small steps because a lot of us probably think, oh, I, if I wasn't in this treadmill, you know, and if I could be like here and go to Nepal and, and you know, kind of break my life away a little bit, uh, then I could start to just follow. But how can I follow, you know, because I've got this that's due to that and this here has to go there and these kids got to go to that school and this. I mean, we just feel like we're stuck in a mechanism. We're just a cog in the in a giant machine and that there's not a space to insert uh, a, any kind of like a pause. And I mean, I think a pause is an important part of it too, because if we're always running, uh, really there's not much space to, uh, to have an insight. Well, what I'd recommend you know, to the people listening, if they're feeling a bit caught on the treadmill and don't feel they have the space or opportunity to have the reflection is Start a diary, start a journal, just five or ten minutes a day. It can be in the morning, during your day, it can be on your computer or a written book. And just writing down some of the thoughts and some of the beliefs that you've got around what you can and can't do in your life. And then after you've written whatever the thought or the idea is, then write down yourself the question, is it true? And then see what comes. And I do suggest the actual writing of it rather than just trying to think it. Because when we think, it often just goes around and around in the head in the same way. But if you write it down or if you speak out loud to a friend, sometimes you actually can see or hear or read a different response that you've come up for yourself, out of yourself, to a situation that you haven't realized before. So that can just be a very simple, practical tool that to have that little bit of a glimpse, a little bit of an insight of something that might you know, be knocking and saying, hello, you could do this a bit differently here. And often that's a bit easier than people trying to make you know, the, the time for sort of meditation or a retreat, which all of those can often be a support as well to give a bit of reflection. They tend to get be put on the back burner, as you say, when people have a very busy life and say, no, I haven't got the time, I've got the kids, and I've got to go here, and I've got to do that, and I've got to work, and I've got to do that. But most people can usually find five or ten minutes to write down the frustrations and the, the issues that are really at the top of the surface of the mind. And just to start a practice of writing that down. And as I said, to follow with the, the question, is it true? and then see what comes. I don't know if, it, if it's, uh, it's all that effective for everyone, but uh, for me, I've been kind of monitoring my anxiety level and just realizing that uh, anxiety might be in every action. And maybe that would be something to write, too, to say, well, what's my call to action here? Well, it's pressure. And uh, is, that, is, there a, is there a time when you can just get fed up with all that pressure and just say, well, look, all this anxiety and must be creating more anxiety. Why don't I just uh, look for a notch? There's another place where you need to kind of look for a notch, you know, and say, well, where is a, a little crack where I can just say, let's have a space of uh, contentment. And just uh, I guess so many people talk about uh, gratitude because gratitude is an easy way to kind of like uh, put anxiety to rest for a couple seconds. I mean, certainly it is. Finding things to be grateful about can help you to feel more of a grace and a calm that helps you to see your life more clearly. That certainly can be, a, again, a help and a very useful practical tool. Uh, for some people, though, it might not feel that easy. So for them, it indeed might be to write down the anxieties or the upsets or the anger or the frustration or the, the fear that is really on the surface and even preventing them, perhaps even touching the gratefulness. And uh, 
you know, certainly someone who's got to the point where they're you know, so incredibly fed up, well, they're already, in a sense, finding the crack. Because um, if you really are fed up enough, then indeed that's often the, the, the push that actually helps you to take the steps that you might need to, to look responsibly at what are you really doing in your life. And is it really of help and support for you and your loved ones around you? I think that would be a very good question that I would like to ask is uh, when you're with Muhammad Yunus, I mean, is he working out of anxiety or uh, is he really working out of some kind of something way, way, way beneath that, you know? He's working from, I would say, a very profound, deep sense of that there really is something else possible. He's not operating, in my experience, from a state of, either trying to change the world or, you know, he's got to do something to make him feel good. No, he, he's coming from a deeper knowing that there is another way, there is something else possible. And he's experimenting, he's following that and seeing what can happen. And he's made an extraordinary impact. And if you read his very first book, um, Banker to the Poor, uh, it's his sort of biography of his journey around the microcredit and it shows his inner process and his sort of thinking process and his sort of awakening process of what happened for him in his discovery of microcredit being a tool to help poor women out of the poverty trap. And when you're directly involved in something that you have a direct experience of it being something beyond the concept it's, I don't quite have a word for it, but it's motivating beyond any idea, goal or concept. It's, it's the natural fuel, it's uplifting, it's generating. I know for myself when I first, you know, I heard about microcredit but I didn't really believe that it worked. So I thought, okay, I'm going to experiment. And uh, with a Nepali friend of mine, we went to a really poor district and we implemented it and uh, I had my own direct experience of realizing hey, this really, really works and uh, the upwelling from that has given me enormous courage to then take further steps. So certainly in my experience of Muhammad Yanis to listening to him speak and you know, seeing what he's doing in the world. He comes more from that place, certainly not a place of anxiety or expectation. So this is, I mean, uh, this, in a way this is uh, exactly what we were saying in the very beginning when you were saying when you have an experience and know, know who, you, who or what you are. So then he knows in a way who or what the collective is. He has an, a collective experience of, of who, who we are, let's say, and then that uh, that just proves the falseness of all uh, of all anxiety or worry. Uh, I mean, I think uh, you hear the same about the Dalai Lama that he doesn't work out of uh, any kind of anxiety, and it's always uh, puzzles puzzling in a way to many people because they say, "Well, I mean, his his population has been devastated, and mm -hmm. uh, but he's not working out of anger. So how does that work? I mean, and." It's just this knowing that we were talking about that is uh, functional with our personal, so-called personal insights, and also with our cultural insights or our insights into our fellow man. And then we're, we're saying that, uh, so that removes the expectation and just uh, says, let's, uh, let's look, you know, let's look at our life. Okay, well, you called it, let's experiment with microcredit. Let's look and uh, give it a try. And that's what we're doing with our lives, too, just saying, let's just look and experiment with our lives and seeing what we see if we take a look. And uh, so, I mean, that's kind of like a, another kind of enlightenment, let's call it. <laughs> Well, I'd caution you on putting too many labels to it, Richard. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or making too many suppositions of what 
you know, the Dalai Lama or Muhammad Yunus might consider about, um, you know, the rest of the world. I think it's fair to say that they each have their own very direct experience of what has, in a sense, worked for them and that's what they live from. And I think that's really the, what I would point to, you know, to come back again to the, the name of your show. I mean, we are never not here. We are always here. And, and this is the point. You know, how do we choose to live our life? And we do, in that sense, we have a choice. We can be more asleep and automatic and be run by our conditioning and our consequent beliefs of ourselves and others and all the consequent expectations, goals and the other side of anxieties, fears and insecurities. Well, there's something else. And that choice is really up to us to discover and find that place. And I definitely advocate the self-discovery to have a look. I love the, what we've got into and what we're talking about because it's so engaged. And somehow, I don't know, am I putting another concept on when I say engagement <laughs> is, is a good thing? <laughs> or, or, you know, we can also choose to be in, uh, isolated or, like you say, not look. You know, or just say, you know, let's just kind of live automatically and make it through the day. <laughs> but the well, engagement, I, I don't know, I like it. <laughs> well, I think what I, I keep um, pointing to perhaps is that it, it really is about each one of us and how we do choose to live in life. And that it isn't a concept, you know, that we get to, you know, going off there somewhere. But, you know, it is here now all the time. And there is an engagement in it. We have to be here. <laughs> um, oh, we can choose not to be. But, you know, I, I, it's mo much more fun in my experience, much more alive, much more juicy, much more um, uh, amazing, really, in terms of experiencing the grace of life to be here. To be aware of the cooking pot and to be cooking. Here we are. Very, very wonderful. <laughs> I, I really thank you <laughs> for, you're very for, for leading us to this, uh, this uh, discovery that uh, we're already here. Let's do it. <laughs> thank you, Kira Kay. You're very welcome, Richard. And uh, you know, thank you for anyone who's stayed with us and you're listening. You know, happy exploring, happy cooking. And my thanks also to, thanks for watching and, and uh, give us your feedback and tell us who you want to see and tell us who you want to see more of. So thank you everyone. Goodbye for now.